The music provided for this episode of the, the Tom Retro Chronicle is brought to you by the song called Rich by the artist called Hans Adam. To check out more Podsafe music, check out cc.mixter.org. Yeah, buddy. Mm, get it. A one, a two, a three, four, five. It is the Tom Retro Chronicle with your host called Tom Retro. Tom Retro is also known as the Retro Guy and has a very interesting angle on things like sports, music, movies, books, and pretty much mostly life. Uh, he has a WordPress account, a very funny Twitter account, and overall a very interesting guy. Yeah, yeah. And also has very interesting interviews like me. So let's head it to our very own special, very special host called Tom Retro. Ah, oh, get it on, man. Woo! Alrighty, and welcome, welcome, my friends, to the show that never ends. <laughs> and welcome to the Tom Retro Chronicle. This is episode 17 of the Tom Retro Chronicle. And I am taping this on a very, very cloudy um, uh, Friday afternoon here in the old uh, Fargo, North Dakota. Yeah. 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 You know, wish it was a little bit, a little bit more of a, a little bit more sunny out, a sunny day out. But you know, eh, oh well, it's it's been sort of snowing somewhat, but oh well. But you can't have, you can't get everything that you want, I suppose. But um, anyway, um, I have a, I have a little bit more of a, a little bit more content-driven, um, show, I suppose. But um. Uh, any, anyway, um, it's pretty much back to the old format, I suppose. Um, pretty much just me talking about two, two to three topics um, for this episode. Uh, first topic is I want to talk about is uh, um, flooding here in uh, Fargo, um, or it as well. So um, I'll talk about a little bit about that a little bit more. Uh, second topic is. Um, Pretty much on uh, the, um, pretty much baseball. Pretty much baseball. Um, I wrote something on um, WordPress uh, yesterday, uh, a little bit about baseball. So uh, I'll probably elaborate that on elaborate that a little bit. Um, and then uh, I think maybe I'm, I think probably I'm gonna do some um, alma mater tales, I suppose. So. So, so yeah, got got that to, got that to look forward to. So, um, I suppose let's uh, begin. Now, for now, I'll, I'll elaborate on this a little bit more. But um, in general, if you lived in pretty much the Fargo Morehead area as long as I have, you typically figure out pretty quick that. Instead of, you know, the normal four seasons, we have, you know, winter, spring, summer, fall, you know, all that sort of deal. Um, in general, we have, we, we, we tend to have two seasons, which is winter and row construction season. So, basically, row construction takes, takes place most of the year, pretty much from... Um, once the first, once most of the snow was gone, it's pretty much, uh, it's pretty much to, um, towards, uh, rebuilding roads. Um, in general, basically, road construction season basically takes up most, most of the spring, um, all of summer, and pretty much most of the fall. So... 
and basically what happens in uh, road construction season is is um basically the city lays out a bunch of projects um, around areas of particularly large um, blocks of streets basically like a stretch of road or something like that and they basically redo it all redo that piece of road um, sometimes it takes maybe a couple weeks sometimes it takes throughout the whole entire summer uh, just kind of more depends on if we get uh, depends if it's wet I mean if it's a wet summer it's gonna take a little bit longer you know that's pretty much common sense but in general if it's a dry summer usually it tends to go by pretty quick so um, in general and basically winter winter is basically pretty much what you expect <laughs> so and I tend to basically split winter into different parts <laughs> like different parts of season of the season like typically when the first snow falls basically t uh, people drive like drive like they've never seen snow before and tend to knock down signs um, go over curbs or uh, rear end rear end crashes um, you know that kind of sort of deal but um, once once winter starts to fall in towards um, towards Christmas time once snow has basically made a foothold on the area basically pretty much goes into the Christmas season the holidays which is basically uh, basically gen basically um uh, after Thanksgiving to uh, New Year's Day I mean that's typically the typically the ground rule for the holidays you know but anyway um and then you have blizzard season which doesn't usually sometimes sometimes it happens in sometimes earlier than December I mean sometimes they're I mean I mean people will agree with me that winter here can be pretty much unpredictable as well as the weather so so it's not really that much of a surprise that uh, winters here can be pretty pretty crazy uh, anyway um, once blizzard season happened is done uh, towards the end of uh, February um, comes uh, puddle season and puddle season is you know puddle season is pretty much puddle season where basically large amounts of puddles start to form and basically people have to maneuver their way through streets and sidewalks just to just to try to keep dry you know um, so so once once that happens pretty much it's it's uh, pothole season pothole season which is pretty much going on right now I mean late late March to work into April is kind of more of pothole season and typically you know what potholes are and they paint they typically are huge holes uh, in streets that pretty much uh, they're pretty much just you know potholes I mean I mean they're pretty much where where puddles used to be pretty much underneath uh, so typically it's typically road road material that is broken away and basically leaves a hole in the street that typically is dangerous to tires because you know it breaks uh, damages the tire quite a bit um, so I definitely try to do so definitely do try to stay away from pot potholes or sometimes chunk holes uh, as they're us as they usually are called and pretty much last last part of the winter season is flood season 
which is pretty much the whole thing that I pretty much want to talk about in this whole entire topic. I'm gonna, I mean, I'm just trying to uh, lay down some uh, basically a typical weather pattern here in Fargo. So, essentially, flood season. Tip, typically, typically fall season. I don't know, flood season. Uh, I said fall, but uh, the flood season goes on from sometimes March into May. Um, so, really, kind of depends on what happens. But in general, floods here. Floods here don't. Uh, floods aren't a common. Aren't. They typically aren't a. A unique thing to happen around here. I mean, they're fa fairly, they they fairly happen often, you know. Typically, the the melting the melting's pretty much almost halfway done, but but this particular winter, basically the heavier snow is way down south, and it's still and it's still melting, so. We, I mean, if you look outside in the, if you live in the area uh, where I live at, Fargo, basically the snow is almost, is about at least halfway, halfway gone. So it's, it's getting there, but um, typically floods, basically the biggest threat to flooding here in Fargo is essentially essentially the Red River of the North, which is basically our main source of water here. Um, sometimes there's the Cheyenne River, which is more west of where I live at. Anyway, anyway, the Cheyenne, Cheyenne always, always floods, but... So, um, anyway, I guess I could talk a little bit more of the history of flooding here. Um, essentially, ever since Fargo was established in 1870, or was it 1875? Uh, I can't remember, but um, it was basically in the 1870s when it was established as a city. Um, basically, the whole history of floods has happen fairly often. So um some of our some of the more um devastating floods was um before I was born, which was nineteen eighty eight, we we had a flood in nineteen sixty nine um which was apparently which was apparently pretty devastating because um you know, you know, floods usually are pretty devastating so but as far as that, I don't really remember that much of you know, bigger floods from 1969 to 1997. But 1997 was, I was pretty much eight years old. I was eight years old at the time of that flood. Um, it was, what should I call it? It was... It was probably the most harshest. the The winter of 1996 and the 97 was probably the most harshest winter that basically the city has ever seen, or the area and the region in general. And when I say region, I mean the Red River Valley. I mean we. I mean Fargo got hit pretty good, but the the biggest uh, the biggest. Um, the biggest hit was um, uh, Grand Forks. I mean, I mean, once once they got over flooded, pretty much. I mean, Grand Forks is pretty pretty much flat, you know, pretty much like Fargo. So, I mean, once once it goes it goes over, once it floods over the um, the area. Uh, basically, the whole entire city floods. So, essentially, um, most of my, pretty much my 
my mother, my aunt and uncle, I'm another aunt, he used to live in Grand Forks, so it was pretty, um, it was pretty devastating to, to see, um, uh, their hometown, there's the place they call home, um, pretty much lost in the city, and pretty much one of the most, um, endearing images of that flood was, um, uh, God, I can't remember her name, but she she was the Grand Forks mayor, and the then president of the time, uh, Bill Clinton, was um, uh, comforting her. It was, I mean, if you um, go to Google and type in Bill Clinton on uh, Grand Forks flood, and you'll typically you should see you should see a picture of him hugging. Um, uh, the Grand Forks mayor, but the the name of the name of the mayor escapes me. I, I think it was Pat. Pat was her first name, but anyway, um, maybe the thought, maybe the name will come by me sooner or later. But um, after '97, there wasn't that much of a big flood until um, until really until 2000, which Essentially, the flood of 2000 didn't really, it wasn't really, it wasn't really, it didn't typically, I don't know, how should I put this? It wasn't in season. I mean, it happened in uh, June of 2000, um, which was basically three months after my, um, my father passed away, so it was still pretty... Uh, the thought of him was still pretty tender in my thoughts, but um, basically, what happened was um, we had a huge, you know, severe thunderstorm, and basically, uh, which was a pretty good, pretty good wallop of thunderstorm. I mean, there was torrential heavy rain. Uh, I think we even had a, like a tornado warning or something. Yeah, somehow or another it didn't uh somehow it didn't hit the ground or I don't think it did, but uh essentially it was basically your garden variety uh severe thunderstorm. So so pretty much afterwards basically <laughs> I mean it's usually common sense to think that if you get a large amount of rain, certainly the river is gonna uh rise. So and which it did, it did rise. So, but not really as not really m as much as people thought it would be. But, um, but pretty much after that, uh, there wasn't that much of a big flood until uh, 2009, which was uh, my sophomore year in college, and I still remember it quite quite well. Uh, essentially. It wasn't the fact that we had a huge amount of snow on the ground. I mean, I mean, typically we usually get a pretty fair amount of snow. Like, God, I don't know. Like, we usually get like, I don't know. We usually get like thirty to forty inches of snow, maybe, maybe a year, maybe, but. Um, I, I have to, I'm not really a meteorologist or anything like that, but essentially, essentially what happened was basically in the melting period started it to quicken and basically the city was basically caught off guard and basically the whole entire fargo Morad area was pretty much in a frantic panic <laughs> about what was going on and I don't know if I mean when it was I mean typically when we uh, usually have floods you know we have sandbaggers so I was I was a sandbagger and pretty much um, the the first day the first day of that flood when I was sandbagging I was basically in a neighborhood which was uh, around the floodplain which was near the river so essentially what happened 
was pretty much we sent back homes um and maybe mostly people know what how sandbags are transferred from area to area. Basically, you have a whole huge line of people, a line of people, um, handing out sandbags in, to each other towards the area where the dike is supposed to be built. So, um, essentially, so essentially, we did that for God. God certainly an awful amount of time. So, um, let's see, let's try to think. Uh, yeah, so, pretty much afterwards, uh, I think by a year after that flood was done, pretty much those houses were, they were, they were pretty much gone. So, I mean, it's pretty sad to see homes like that go adios, but um, it's just a sad fact of life. I mean, if you live near the floodplain, you usually can expect that you get um, flooded. So, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty much, we got fed. We got fed pretty good. I mean, we were, we were pretty catered pretty good. So, but it was the second it was it was the second day that um cuz i did cuz i did it um basically two days in a row and the second day um basically it was raining pretty hard and for what seemed like forever what seemed like forever um lasted for Four hours, I think, maybe at least. Uh, all I remember was I was, I was pretty much soaking wet. Um, I was sore. Um, I was sore. My back was sore. My arms were sore, and and uh, basically the Minnesota National Guard was uh, helping out with the effort, so. So I still have that memory in my mind. Basically, the whole um, National Guard um, patrolling the campus. The essentially the campus. Um, I mean, is uh, MSUM, which which was the area where I lived at. And basically, the areas I sandbagged were me and my uh, floor mates were at. They were uh, they were they were helping out too. So they were in the the city was in Moorhead, so so gotta give gotta give them a lot of credit too. So um anyway, pretty much a good while after that um basically the whole river was starting to uh rise and rise and rise and rise. And pretty much um, I was a DJ. Uh, I was a DJ at KMSC, and I decided to do. I decided to do, a, you know, like a two-hour show just to line the spirits of people. And somehow or another, I decided to um, shut off my phone. So my phone at the time. So you know, because I didn't want uh, distraction to happen during the show. So, so I did a two-hour show just to, you know, just to align the mood um, of people. Um, so, pretty much after that, um, I turned on my phone and pretty much my whole entire phone was ringing because my mother um, was concerned about my own well-being. And basically, the river what's itself was... The river itself was about around 39 feet, and typically the dikes were built to handle at least uh, 42 feet, at least. So, um, so I pretty much it was pretty much up to me to decide if I wanted to 
um, pack my things, pack uh, whatever things that I could um, put in my bag or just wait until the early morning to come home and um, head out to God knows where. Um, so, so what happened was I basically did the latter choice and I split, uh, grabbed my clothes, my laundry, uh, my laptop, and pretty much just went home to uh, see my mom just uh, go all crazy. You know, she was, you know, she was worried. She was basically just about as worried as pretty much everyone else. Uh, to s just to see what would happen. So, so after, so after that night, pretty much we went up to Grand Forks along with our cat, uh, just to see the relatives, and basically just to wait it out until, just to wait it out until what happens next. And essentially, the river did rise. It just, it didn't get to 42 feet. Luckily, thank God. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, basically, the record crest was at 40.82 40 feet. And that has been the record since. Record crest. So, so, yeah. So, I suppose there, there, there is there is a point to what I'm trying to say is um, uh, tomorrow I'm probably gonna go uh, pitch in and go to go to the city's uh, Sandbats Sandbags Central uh, to lend up lend a helping hand. But uh, you know I'm not I'm not afraid to help or at any at any cost. I mean I'm. I mean, I like, I like the city. I like to help out uh, the people, but, um, but pretty much after 2009, there wasn't, there wasn't, there has been floods. Uh, the 2010 flood was, you know, it was, it was kind of more of a, it was a big flood, but not as, not. Not really as major as 2009. Uh, I mean, I think the city learned a lesson. Um, uh, then in uh, 2011, which was my uh, my senior year, uh, I mean, there was a flood, but <laughs> it was nothing, nothing to really get all worked up about. So, uh, and then last year, basically, I think. A lot of you knew that. Um, I think I well, I think I told you that we didn't really have that much of a flood. I mean, pretty much the snow, the snow was gone pretty much by before uh, St. Patrick's St. Patrick's Day. So it was it was pretty cool to could. It was a good break to. It was a good break to not really have to deal with a flood at that particular time. So. So, so am I worried about about a flood that is major as two thousand nine? Nah, not 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 really, not really. But um, anyway, um, so tomorrow I'm probably gonna help out help out the city, help out the city in Fargo. And do what I can to help out. So, um, anyway, I'll, let's get on to the next topic. Uh, probably I'm not going to do Elma Mater Tales. So I'll see about doing it tomorrow. Anyway, so I wrote a column. Uh -huh. um, I like I like to call it a column, but um, essentially what I wrote was. Um, I say I wrote a bunch of stuff about um, my thoughts on the baseball season itself so far. Um, essentially, but 
upon essentially I wrote down a couple of things that I felt were kind of more I felt that they were kind of important so some things I thought about was um, uh, the Yankees who boy the the Yankees can't they the Yankees can't seem to catch a break I mean I mean, as much as I like to hate the Yankees, I mean, I still kind of sort of maybe a little bit respect them. I don't, I don't respect their uh, bandwagon fans at all. But essentially what I was trying to go get at, um, basically the main point, what I thought was uh, the Yankees... I don't know what's with the Yankees. I mean, what the Yankees like to do is they try to sign uh, players that are that are pretty much um, older, older than older than 30 years old. And essentially, essentially some of the names that they that they that they have is Hideki Kuroda is. 38 years old, Andy Pettit is 40, Jeter 38, Lyle Overbay <laughs> uh, is uh, 36, um, A-Rod 37, Euclid is 34, and the team out. <clears throat> excuse me, and the team average is uh, 30 years old, so they're they're pretty much right in the middle uh, in terms of old as an old team, but um, essentially, they have seven players on the disabled list, which is pretty staggering. And basically, the whole timetable for Derek Jeter to come come back from um, from the disabled list is pretty pretty much unknown, which is not really not really looking that much good of a sign for uh, Yankees fans. So. So here's the here's the thing that troubles me more than anything. The the Yankees don't try to get younger. They don't try to get people from their farm system, which which I've heard their their farm system their farm system seems pretty good. I mean somehow with all the with all the trades that they give away to um, teams just to get uh, older players like Hideki um, Hideki Kuroda or actually um, Ichiro Ichiro Suzuki Suzuki excuse me but essentially essentially the Yankees don't try to get younger people I mean and this this problem has been going on since pretty much as long as I can remember I mean, I mean they when when the Yankees signed Vernon Wells, Vernon Wells to a deal. <laughs> I was like, really, Vernon Wells? I mean, the guys. I haven't even heard of the name Vernon Wells in years, years. I haven't heard about his name in pretty much God God knows how my amount of time. So. So uh, that was the first point that I made. Uh, the second point I made was um, the Tigers' bullpen is still not really that great. Essentially, the Tigers are still are still troubled by uh, the thing that basically did them in uh, last season during the World Series, which was which essentially was. You know, which you know was essentially uh, bullpen issues, and basically continues on uh, to today. So, so I basically threw out a couple stats here, you know, in terms of the uh, earned run average, and the team's ERA right now is at 2.6, which is pretty good. You know, typically I think, uh, typically I think three, 
uh, an ERA of at least three um, is pretty good. I mean, it's pretty average. So, so that's not really that much of the problem. the The problem is the uh, relief pitchers. A smiley, uh, uh, smiley zero rate is at thirteen point five zero. Uh, Downs is at six point seven five, and Phil Coke uh, is at nine point zero, which is pretty staggering numbers to say the least about the Tigers uh, bullpen. So, and uh, the third point um, is the Houston Astros. Uh, I basically said this before about the Houston Astros, how they should have stayed in the National League instead of the uh, instead of from going to the American League. Um, I wanted to see the Brewers come back to the American League, but that was not my choice. So, but essentially, essentially the Astros are at one one and two, which is I mean it's kind of a little bit more surprising to me than perhaps maybe most people would think about. I thought the I thought the Astros would be a one three. I thought the Rangers would sweep uh, would sweep uh, the Astros, but somehow. Um, Um, essentially, if you watch the opening night game of the Rangers and Astros game on Sunday, last Sunday, uh, the Rangers pretty much got beat by <laughs> somehow or another by the Astros by the score of eight to two, and pretty much after that, it pretty much went downhill <laughs> from there. I mean, the Rangers, the the Rangers got revenge <laughs> for the first night. Uh, the Astros lost to the Rangers seven to zero and and uh, four to zero. So essentially, the Astros gave up eleven runs in two days. So I don't know. This kind of seems to me interesting. But uh, the fourth point uh, I wanted to make in the post, uh, the column that I made was uh, the Red Sox. Of course, the Red Sox are my team. So essentially, the Red Sox are two and zero, oh, two two and one. Excuse me. Uh, the Red Sox, the, the Red Sox look pretty good. I mean, I mean they could probably tank, tank and burn for pretty much the rest of the season. But in terms of the first three games, I mean they look pretty good. Uh, the biggest story that I think out of it all is Jackie Bradley Jr., um, which was part of our farm system for a good couple of years, and he's basically already a household name. I mean, that catch uh, during opening day against the Yankees on Monday, that thing was a thing of beauty. I mean, he went back quite a ways towards... Um, uh, left field, and basically he got caught that ball pretty good. Uh, then he got his first hit on uh, the second, the the second game. Um, got his first hit on the second game, so so it looks pretty promising career for for him. Um, some other areas that I think are pretty. Are doing pretty good. Our third pitching, our starting pitching is starting to finally to starting to come back quite a bit. Uh, I mean, they're starting to get um, uh, pretty good starts. Uh, typical quality starts for me is at least um, six six innings worth of work completed. Um, at least eight strikeouts. Um, maybe a couple walks here and there, but. Um, Maybe sometimes, I mean, sometimes a couple of earned runs, maybe sometimes. But typically, you try not to get too many earned runs. So, our hitting our hitting is pretty good. Our, I mean, our hitting is pretty much our uh, cornerstone. I'd like to, th some people like to think our starting pitching is our cornerstone. I mean, yeah, starting pitching is pretty much, pretty much always important, so... 
So it's it's good to see those two areas back towards a balance instead of last season. Essentially, last season, the reason why last season sucked was because we we uh, we couldn't get uh, consistent pitching from our starters or our bullpen. Basically, our 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 hitting was our hitting was the the hitting was doing their their fair share of the work. It was just the starting pitching that just couldn't hold their hold their own. And if you're a typical baseball fan, I mean, hitting will take you so far. But it's pretty much starting pitching that has to take that has to take over for has to take over from pretty much where the hitting was at. I mean, yeah, you can hit home runs, but if you can't hold down the fort while well, hitting is trying to back you up, then you're not going to win that many games. So, so at least it's at least it's good to see that the Red Sox are at least somewhat back to relevancy after uh, last season. So, um, pretty much for this topic, I'm pretty much done with it. Let's see, it looks like I got. Uh, looks like I got uh, voicemail. Let's see. At least I got some sort of audio message or something on uh, my answering machine. So let's see what. See what's up. Hey, um, this is uh, this is uh, Stevens call. I'm not sure if this is this is the right number or not, but um, you know, I'm. I mean, for those who do not know, I'm I'm Steven Seagal. Oh my God, I hope this is Domino's. Um, um, I didn't really look at the number all that well, but essentially, essentially, if um, if Tom Wagner works at Domino's, I want my I want my baby I want my pizza to be um, well made. I want my pepperoni, my sausage, my Canadian bacon on one side, and then I want my anchovies because Action Heroes won their anchovies on one the other side, or that basically does not, does, it just does not work, okay, you know, because I'm getting tired of, I'm getting tired of this bullshit that Pizza Hut puts on their pizza, okay, I mean, I asked for anchovies, but, you know, essentially, essentially, someone, someone from the Pizza Hut just didn't, just didn't fit my order, right, so, I called them, so I called them, and I, I told them, listen, I want my anchovies on the other side, not, I just don't want you people to call, to call me, and say that we don't have any anchovies, because my Stephen Seagal diet has to be anchovies, okay? And I've never been to a Pizza Hut ever since. And that was probably back in 19... Oh, God, 1986. Maybe... Maybe that was the... Maybe that was the first time I did my first action movie. Nah, maybe it was 1996. God, I don't remember, but... Anyway, if this is a Domino's... You know what's up? I want my anchovies on the real side. Okay, because Steven Skull's fans, they know what's up, okay? We want our anchovies! Anyway, if, if Tom Wagner works at Domino's, I demand my anchovies. And Tom, if you do not, if you do not, do not call me. Because FBI surveillance fans are all over the place. Okay, and if you somehow decide to call this number, which is 555-222-5555, do not call the number. Please, 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 please do not call this number. Okay. Um, you know what's going to happen? Basically what happened with that pizza hut? I came into their store. I gave them only one four. 
stole all the anchovies from their pantry while their manager was somehow severely disfigured after by after by my own doing. Okay. Anyway, this is a Stevens call. Do not call me. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Holy cow. That was that was probably the most interesting um that was pretty much the most interesting voicemail that I ever received received from uh Stevens Gall. Uh, for those who remember, um, Stevens Gall called, uh, left me a voicemail um, sometime back in January uh, this year. So it was a couple months ago. So, so I promise that. So actually, no, Steven, I'm not actually working at, uh, I'm not actually working at Domino's. So, so don't try to get any ideas about me trying to call you. And I promise that I won't try to call you. Okay. So just don't, so just don't, don't, don't expect me to call you. Okay. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> that was probably the most interesting, that was probably the most interesting, you know, voicemail I ever received from anybody. But anyway, um, I'm going to call this episode pretty much good since I'm pretty much over the 40 minute mark. I usually try to get this at least to 45 minutes or so. So expect, probably expect a new episode of the uh, the podcast sometime on Tuesday. Um, I'll probably let you know on Twitter, which my Twitter handle um, celebrated four years of epicness um, yesterday. So if you do not know what the Twitter handle is, uh, definitely check it out. It's uh, at Darth um, underscore Tom. So, um, so I will see you all on, uh, uh, sometime Tuesday, sometime Tuesday. Later. Peace.